Chapter 5 First Cell, First Love How is one to take the title of this chapter, A Cell and Love, in the same breath? Ah, well, probably it has to do with Leningrad during the blockade, and you were imprisoned in the big house. In that case, it would be very understandable. That's why you were still alive, because they shoved you in there. It was the best place in Leningrad, not only for the interrogators who even lived there and had offices in the cellars in case of shelling. Joking aside, in Leningrad in those days no one washed and everyone's face was covered with a black crust. But in the big house, prisoners were given a hot shower every tenth day. Well, it's true that only the corridors were heated for the jailers. The cells were left unheated, but after all, there were water pipes in the cells that worked and a toilet, and where else in Leningrad could you find that? And the bread ration was just like the ration outside, barely four and a half ounces. In addition, there was broth made from slaughtered horses once a day, and thin gruel once a day as well. It was a case of the cats being envious of the dog's life. But what about punishment cells? And what about the supreme measure, execution? No, that isn't what the chapter title is about. Not at all. You sit down and half-close your eyes and try to remember them all. How many different cells you were imprisoned in during your term? It is difficult even to count them. And in each one there were people. People. There might be two people in one, one hundred and fifty in another. You were imprisoned for five minutes in one, and all summer long in another. But in every case, out of all the cells you've been in, your first cell is a very special one, the place where you first encountered others like yourself, doomed to the same fate. All your life you will remember it with an emotion that you otherwise experience only in remembering your first love, and those people who shared with you the floor and air of that stone cubicle during those days when you rethought your entire life, will from time to time be recollected by you as members of your own family. Yes, in those days, they were your only family. What you experience in your first interrogation cell parallels nothing in your entire previous life or your whole subsequent life. No doubt prisons have stood for thousands of years before you came along and may continue to stand after you, too, longer than one would like to think. But that first interrogation cell is unique and inimitable. Maybe it was a terrible place for a human being, a lice-laden, bed-bug-infested lock-up, without windows, without ventilation, without bunks, and with a dirty floor, a box called a KPZ. KPZ equals cell for preliminary detention. DPZ equals house of preliminary detention. In other words, where interrogations are conducted, not where sentences are served. In the village Soviet at the police station, in the railroad station, or in some port. The KPZs and the DPZs are scattered across the face of our land in the greatest abundance. There are masses of prisoners in them. Or maybe it was solitary in the Archangel prison, where the glass had been smeared over with red lead so that the only rays of God's maimed light which crept into you were crimson, and where a fifteen-watt bulb burned constantly in the ceiling day and night. Or solitary in the city of Choibalsan, where, for six months at a time, fourteen of you were crowded onto seven square yards of floor space in such a way that you could only shift your bent legs in unison. Or it was one of the Lefortovo psychological cells, like number 111, which was painted black and also had a day and night 25-watt bulb, but was in all other respects like every other Lefortovo cell, asphalt floor, the heating valve out in the corridor where only the guards had access to it, and above all, that interminable irritating roar from the wind tunnel of the neighboring Central Aero and Hydrodynamics Institute, a roar one could not believe was unintentional, a roar which would make a bowl or cup vibrate so violently that it would slip off the edge of the table, a roar which made it useless to converse and during which one could sing at the top of one's lungs and the jailer wouldn't even hear. And then, when the roar stopped, there would ensue a sense of relief and felicity superior to freedom itself. But it was not the dirty floor, nor the murky walls, nor the odor of the latrine bucket that you loved, but those fellow prisoners with whom you were about faced at command, 
and that something which beat between your heart and theirs, and their sometimes astonishing words, and then, too, the birth within you on that very spot of free-floating thoughts you had so recently been unable to leap or rise to, and how much it had cost you to last out until that first cell. You had been kept in a pit or in a box or in a cellar. No one had addressed a human word to you. No one had looked at you with a human gaze. All they did was to peck at your brain and heart with iron beaks, and when you cried out or groaned, they laughed. For a week or a month you had been an abandoned waif, alone among enemies, and you had already said goodbye to reason and to life and you had already tried to kill yourself by falling from the radiator in such a way as to smash your brains against the iron cone of the valve. Then, all of a sudden, you were alive again, and you were brought into your friends, and reason returned to you. That's what your first cell is. You waited for that cell. You dreamed of it almost as eagerly as of freedom. Meanwhile, they kept shoving you around between cracks in the wall and holes in the ground, from Le Fortovo, into some legendary, diabolical Sukhanovka. Sukhanovka was the most terrible prison the MGB had. Its very name was used to intimidate prisoners. Interrogators would hiss it, threateningly, and you'd not be able to question those who had been there. Either they were insane and talking only disconnected nonsense, or they were dead. Sukhanovka was a former monastery dating back to Catherine the Great. It consisted of two buildings, one in which prisoners served out their terms, and the other a structure that contained 68 monks' cells and was used for interrogations. The journey there in the Black Mariah took two hours, and only a handful of people knew that the prison was really just a few miles from Lenin's Gorky estate, and near the former estate of Zinaida Volkonskaya. The countryside surrounding it was beautiful. There they stunned the newly arrived prisoner with a stand-up punishment cell again so narrow that when he was no longer able to stand he had to sag, supported by his bent knees propped against the wall. There was no alternative. They kept prisoners thus for more than a day to break their resistance. But they ate tender, tasty food at Sukhanovka, which was like nothing else in the MGB, because it was brought in from the architect's rest home. They didn't maintain a separate kitchen to prepare hogwash. However, the amount one architect would eat, including fried potatoes and meatballs, was divided among twelve prisoners. As a result, the prisoners were not only always hungry, but also exceedingly irritable. The cells were all built for two, but prisoners under interrogation were usually kept in them singly. The dimensions were five by six and a half feet. To be absolutely precise, they were 156 centimetres by 209 centimetres. How do we know, through a triumph of engineering calculation and a strong heart, that even Sukhanovka could not break? The measurements were the work of Alexander D., who would not allow them to drive him to madness or despair. He resisted by striving to use his mind to calculate distances. In Le Fortovo, he counted steps, converted them into kilometres, remembered from a map how many kilometers it was from Moscow to the border, and then how many across all Europe, and how many across the Atlantic Ocean. He was sustained in this by the hope of returning to America. And in one year, in Le Fortovo solitary, he got, so to speak, halfway across the Atlantic. Thereupon they took him to Sukhanovka. Here, realizing how few would survive to tell of it, and all our information about it comes from him, he invented a method of measuring the cell. The numbers 10 slash 22 were stamped on the bottom of his prison bowl, and he guessed that 10 was the diameter of the bottom and 22 the diameter of the outside edge. Then he pulled a thread from a towel, made himself a tape measure, and measured everything with it. Then he began to invent a way of sleeping standing up, propping his knees against the small chair, and of deceiving the guard into thinking his eyes were open. He succeeded in this deception, and that was how he managed not to go insane when Ryumin kept him sleepless for a month. Two little round stools were welded to the stone floor like stumps, and at night, if the guard unlocked a cylinder lock, a shelf dropped from the wall onto each stump and remained there for seven hours. In other words, during the hours of interrogation, since there was no daytime interrogation at Sukhanovka at all, 
and a little straw mattress large enough for a child also dropped down. During the day, the stool was exposed and free, but one was forbidden to sit on it. In addition, a table lay like an ironing board on four upright pipes. The fortochka in the window, the small hinged pane for ventilation, was always closed except for ten minutes in the morning when the guard cranked it open. The glass in the little window was reinforced. There were never any exercise periods out of doors. Prisoners were taken to the toilet at 6 a.m. only, that is, when no one's stomach needed it. There was no toilet period in the evening. There were two guards for each block of seven cells, so that was why the prisoners could be under almost constant inspection through the peephole, the only interruption being the time it took the guard to step past two doors to a third. And that was the purpose of silent Sukhanovka, to leave the prisoner not a single moment for sleep, not a single stolen moment for privacy. You were always being watched and always in their power. But if you endured the whole duel with insanity and all the trials of loneliness and had stood firm, you deserved your first cell, and now when you got into it, your soul would heal. If you had surrendered, if you had given in and betrayed everyone, you were also ready for your first cell, but it would have been better for you not to have lived until that happy moment and to have died a victor in the cellar without having signed a single sheet of paper. Now, for the first time, you were about to see people who were not your enemies. Now, for the first time, you were about to see others who were alive, who were traveling your road, and whom you could join to yourself with the joyous word, We. And if this was in the big house in Leningrad during the siege, you may also have seen cannibals, those who had eaten human flesh, those who had traded in human livers from dissecting rooms, were for some reason kept by the MGB with the political prisoners. Yes, that word which you may have despised out in freedom when they used it as a substitute for your own individuality, all of us, like one man, or we are deeply angered, or we demand, or we swear, is now revealed to you as something sweet. You are not alone in the world. Wise, spiritual beings, human beings, still exist. I had been dueling for four days with the interrogator when the jailer, having waited until I lay down to sleep in my blindingly lit box, began to unlock my door. I heard him all right, but before he could say, get up interrogation, I wanted to lie for another three hundredths of a second with my head on the pillow and pretend I was sleeping. But instead of the familiar command, the guard ordered, Get up, pick up your bedding. Uncomprehending and unhappy because this was my most precious time, I wound on my footcloths, put on my boots, my overcoat, my winter cap, and clasped the government-issue mattress in my arms. The guard was walking on tiptoe and kept signaling me not to make any noise as he led me down a corridor silent as the grave, through the fourth floor of the Lubyanka, past the desk of the section supervisor, past the shiny numbers on the cells and the olive-colored covers of the peepholes, and unlocked cell 67. I entered, and he locked it behind me immediately. Even though only a quarter of an hour or so had passed since the signal to go to sleep had been given, the period allotted the prisoners for sleeping was so fragile and undependable and brief that by the time I arrived, the inhabitants of cell 67 were already asleep on their metal cots with their hands on top of the blankets. New measures of oppression, additions to the traditional prison regulations, were invented only gradually in the internal prisons of the GPU, NKVD, MGB. At the beginning of the 20s, prisoners were not subjected to this particular measure, and lights were turned off at night as in the ordinary world. But they began to keep the lights on, on the logical grounds that they needed to keep the prisoners in view at all times. When they used to turn the lights on for inspection, it had been even worse. Arms had to be kept outside the blanket, allegedly to prevent the prisoner from strangling himself beneath the blanket, and thus escaping his just interrogation. It was demonstrated experimentally that in the winter a human being always wants to keep his arms under the bedclothes for warmth. Consequently, the measure was made permanent. 
At the sound of the door opening, all three started and raised their heads for an instant. They, too, were waiting to learn which of them might be taken to interrogation. And those three lifted heads, those three unshaven, crumpled, pale faces, seemed to me so human, so dear, that I stood there hugging my mattress and smiled with happiness. And they smiled, and what a forgotten look that was, after only one week. Are you from freedom? they asked me. That was the question customarily put to a newcomer. No, I replied, and that was a newcomer's usual first reply. They had in mind that I had probably been arrested recently, which meant that I came from freedom, and I, after ninety-six hours of interrogation, hardly considered that I was from freedom. Was I not already a veteran prisoner? Nonetheless, I was from freedom. The beardless old man with the black and very lively eyebrows was already asking me for military and political news. Astonishing! Even though it was late February, they knew nothing about the Yalta Conference, nor the encirclement of East Prussia, nor anything at all about our own attack below Warsaw in mid-January, nor even about the woeful December retreat of the Allies. According to regulations, those under interrogation were not supposed to know anything about the outside world, and here, indeed, they didn't. I was prepared to spend half the night telling them all about it, with pride, as though all the victories and advances were the work of my own hands. But at this point the duty jailer brought in my cot, and I had to set it up without making any noise. I was helped by a young fellow my own age, also a military man. His tunic and aviator's cap hung on his cot. He had asked me, even before the old man spoke, not for news of the war, but for tobacco. But although I felt open-hearted toward my new friends, and although not many words had been exchanged in the few minutes since I joined them, I sensed something alien in this front-line soldier who was my contemporary, and as far as he was concerned, I clammed up immediately and forever. I had not yet even heard the word Nasidka, stool pigeon, nor learned that there had to be one such stool pigeon in each cell and I had not yet had time to think things over and conclude that I did not like this fellow, Georgi Kramarenko. But a spiritual relay, a sensor relay, had clicked inside me, and it had closed him off from me for good and all. I would not bother to recall this event, if it had been the only one of its kind. But soon, with astonishment and alarm, I became aware of the work of this internal sensor relay as a constant inborn trait. The years passed, and I lay on the same bunks, marched in the same formations, and worked in the same work brigades with hundreds of others. And always that secret sensor relay, for whose creation I deserved not the least bit of credit, worked even before I remembered it was there, worked at the first sight of a human face and eyes, at the first sound of a voice, so that I opened my heart to that person either fully or just the width of a crack, or else shut myself off from him completely. This was so consistently unfailing that all the efforts of the state security officers to employ stool pigeons began to seem to me as insignificant as being pestered by gnats. After all, a person who has undertaken to be a traitor always betrays the fact in his face and in his voice, and even though some were more skilled in pretense, there was always something fishy about them. On the other hand, the sensor relay helped me distinguish those to whom I could, from the very beginning of our acquaintance, completely disclose my most precious depths and secrets, secrets for which heads roll. Thus it was that I got through eight years of imprisonment, three years of exile, and another six years of underground authorship, which were in no wise less dangerous. During all those seventeen years, I recklessly revealed myself to dozens of people and didn't make a misstep even once. I have never read about this trait anywhere, and I mention it here for those interested in psychology. It seems to me that such spiritual sensors exist in many of us, but because we live in too technological and rational an age, we neglect this miracle and don't allow it to develop. We set up the cart, and I was then ready to talk, in a whisper, of course, and lying down, so as not to be sent from this cosy nest into a punishment cell. But our third cellmate, a middle-aged man whose cropped head already showed the white bristles of imminent greyness, peered at me discontentedly and said with characteristic northern severity, Tomorrow night is for sleeping.
That was the most intelligent thing to do. At any minute, one of us could have been pulled out for interrogation and held until 6 a.m., when the interrogator would go home to sleep, but we were forbidden to. One night of undisturbed sleep was more important than all the fates on earth. One more thing held me back, which I didn't quite catch right away, but had felt nonetheless from the first words of my story, although I could not at this early date find a name for it. As each of us had been arrested, everything in our world had switched places. A 180-degree shift in all our concepts had occurred, and the good news I had begun to recount with such enthusiasm might not be good news for us at all. My cellmates turned on their sides, covered their eyes with their handkerchiefs to keep out the light from the 200-watt bulb, wound towels around their upper arms, which were chilled from lying on top of the blankets, hid their lower arms furtively beneath them, and went to sleep. And I lay there, filled to the brim with the joy of being among them. One hour ago I could not have counted on being with anyone. I could have come to my end with a bullet in the back of my head, which was what the interrogator kept promising me, without having seen anyone at all. Interrogation still hung over me, but how far it had retreated. Tomorrow I would be telling them my story, though not talking about my case, of course, and they would be telling me their stories, too. How interesting tomorrow would be, one of the best days of my life. Thus, very early and very clearly, I had this consciousness that prison was not an abyss for me, but the most important turning point in my life. Every detail of the cell interested me. Sleep fled, and when the peephole was not in use, I studied it all furtively. Up there at the top of one wall was a small indentation the length of three bricks, covered by a dark blue paper blind. They had already told me it was a window. Yes, there was a window in the cell, and the blind served as an air raid blackout. Tomorrow there would be weak daylight, and in the middle of the day they would turn off the glaring light bulb. How much that meant, to have daylight in daytime. There was also a table in the cell. On it, in the most conspicuous spot, were a teapot, a chess set, and a small pile of books. I was not yet aware why they were so conspicuously positioned. It turned out to be another example of the Lubyanka system at work. During his once-a-minute peephole inspection, the jailer was supposed to make sure that the gifts of the prison administration were not being misused, that the teapot was not being used to break down the wall, that no one was swallowing the chessmen and thereby possibly cashing in his chips and ceasing to be a citizen of the USSR, and that no one was starting a fire with the books in the hope of burning down the whole prison and a prisoner's eyeglasses were considered so potentially dangerous that they were not allowed to remain on the table during the night. The prison administration took them away until morning. What a cosy life! Chess, books, cots with springs, decent mattresses, clean linen. I could not remember having slept like this during the whole war. There was a worn parquet floor. One could take nearly four strides from window to door in the aisle between the cots. No, indeed, this central political prison was a real resort. And no shells were falling. I remembered their sound, the high-pitched sobbing way up overhead, then the rising whistle and the crash as they burst, and how tenderly the mortar shells whistled, and how everything trembled from the four blasts of what we called Dr. Goebbels' mortar rockets. And I remember the wet snow and mud near Wormdit, where I had been arrested, which our men were still wading through to keep the Germans from breaking out of our encirclement. All right, then. The hell with you. If you don't want me to fight, I won't. Among our many lost values, there is one more. The high worth of those people who spoke and wrote Russian before us. It is odd that they are almost undescribed in our pre-revolutionary literature. Only very rarely do we feel their breath from Marina Tsvetaeva, or from Mother Maria in her recollections of Bloch. They saw too much to settle on any one thing. They reached toward the sublime too fervently to stand firmly on the earth. Before society's fall, just such a stratum of wise, thinking people emerges, people who are that and nothing more. And how they were laughed at, how they were mocked, as though they stuck in the craw of people whose deeds and actions were single-minded and narrow-minded, 
and the only nickname they were christened with was Rot, because these people were a flower that bloomed too soon and breathed too delicate a fragrance, and so they were mowed down. These people were particularly helpless in their personal lives. They could neither bend with the wind, nor pretend, nor get by. Every word declared an opinion, a passion, a protest. And it was just such people the mowing machine cut down, just such people the chaff cutter shredded. I am almost fearful of saying it, but it seems as though on the eve of the 1970s these people are emerging once again. That is surprising. It was almost too much to hope for. They had passed through these very same cells, but the cell walls, for the wallpaper had long since been stripped off, and they had been plastered, whitewashed, and painted more than once, gave off nothing of the past. On the contrary, the walls now tried to listen to us with hidden microphones. Nowhere is anything written down or reported of the former inhabitants of these cells, of the conversations held in them, of the thoughts with which earlier inmates went forth to be shot. Or to imprisonment on the Solovetsky Islands, and now such a volume, which would be worth forty freight car loads of our literature, will in all probability never be written. Those still alive recount to us all sorts of trivial details: that there used to be wooden trestle beds here, and that the mattresses were stuffed with straw; that way back in 1920, before they put muzzles over the windows, the panes were whitewashed up to the top. By 1923, muzzles had been installed, although we unanimously ascribed them to Beria. They said that back in the 20s, prison authorities had been very lenient toward prisoners communicating with each other by knocking on the walls. This was a carryover from the stupid tradition in the Tsarist prisons that if the prisoners were deprived of knocking, they would have no way to occupy their time. And another thing. Back in the twenties, all the jailers were Latvians from the Latvian Red Army units and others, and the food was all handed out by strapping Latvian women. All this was trivial detail, but it was certainly food for thought. I myself had needed very badly to get into this main Soviet political prison, and I was grateful that I had been sent here. I thought about Bukharin a great deal, and I wanted to picture the whole thing as it had actually been. However, I had the impression that we were by now merely the remnants, and that in this respect we might just as well have been in any provincial internal prison, one attached to a state security headquarters. Still, there was a good deal of status in being here, and there was no reason to be bored with my companions in my new cell. They were people to listen to and people with whom to compare notes. The old fellow with the lively eyebrows, and at sixty-three he in no way bore himself like an old man, was Anatoly Ilyich Fastenko. He was a big asset to our Lubyanka cell, both as a keeper of the old Russian prison traditions and as a living history of Russian revolutions. Thanks to all that he remembered, he somehow managed to put in perspective everything that had taken place in the past and everything that was taking place in the present. Such people are valuable not only in a cell. We badly need them in our society as a whole. Right there in our cell, we read Fastenko's name in a book about the 1905 revolution. He had been a social democrat for such a long, long time that in the end, it seemed, he had ceased to be one. He had been sentenced to his first prison term in 1904 while still a young man, but he had been freed outright under the manifesto proclaimed on October the 17th, 1905. Who among us has not learned by heart from our school history courses, as well as from the short course in the history of the Soviet Communist Party, that this provocative and foul manifesto was a mockery of freedom, that the Tsar had proclaimed freedom for the dead and prison for the living? But the epigram was bogus. The manifesto declared that all political parties were to be tolerated, and that a state Duma was to be convened, and it provided for an amnesty which was honest and extremely extensive. The fact that it had been issued under duress was something else again. Indeed, under its terms, none other than all political prisoners, without exception, were to be released without reference to the term and type of punishment they had been sentenced to. Only criminals remained imprisoned. The Stalin amnesty of July the seventh, nineteen forty-five—true, it was not issued under duress—was exactly the opposite. 
all the political prisoners remained imprisoned. His story about that amnesty was interesting. In those years, of course, there were no muzzles on the prison windows, and from the cells of the Belaya Tserkov prison, in which Fastenko was being held, the prisoners could easily observe the prison courtyard and the street, and all arrivals and departures, and they could shout back and forth as they pleased to ordinary citizens outside. During the day of October the 17th, these outsiders, having learned of the amnesty by telegraph, announced the news to the prisoners. In their happiness, the political prisoners went wild with joy. They smashed window panes, broke down doors, and demanded that the prison warden release them immediately. And were any of them kicked right in the snout with jackboots, or put in punishment cells, or was anyone deprived of library and commissary privileges? Of course not. In his distress, the warden ran from cell to cell and implored them, Gentlemen, I beg of you, please be reasonable. I don't have the authority to release you on the basis of a telegraphed report. I must have direct orders from my superiors in Kiev. Please, I beg of you, you will have to spend the night here. And in actual fact, they were most barbarously kept there for one more day. After Stalin's amnesty, as I will recount later, those amnestied were held in prison for another two or three months and were forced to slog away just as before. And no one considered this illegal. On getting back their freedom, Fastenko and his comrades immediately rushed to join the revolution. In 1906, he was sentenced to eight years at hard labor, which meant four years in irons and four in exile. He served the first four years in the Sevastopol Central Prison, where, incidentally, during his stay, a mass escape was organized from outside by a coalition of revolutionary parties, the SRs, the anarchists, and the social democrats. A bomb blew a hole in the prison wall, big enough for a horse and rider to go through. And two dozen prisoners, not everyone who wanted to escape, but those who had been chosen ahead of time by their parties and, right inside the prison, had been equipped with pistols by the jailers, fled through the hole and escaped. All but one. Anatoly Fastenko was selected by the Russian Social Democratic Party not to escape, but to cause a disturbance in order to distract the attention of the guards. On the other hand, when he reached exile in the Yenisei area, he did not stay there long. Comparing his stories, and later those of others who had survived, with the well-known fact that under the Tsar our revolution has escaped from exile by the hundreds and hundreds, and more and more of them went abroad, one comes to the conclusion that the only prisoners who did not escape from Tsarist exile were the lazy ones, because it was so easy. Fastenko escaped, which is to say he simply left his place of exile without a passport. He went to Vladivostok, expecting to get aboard a steamer through an acquaintance there. Somehow, it did not work out. So then, still without a passport, he calmly crossed the whole of Mother Russia on a train and went to the Ukraine, where he had been a member of the Bolshevik underground and where he had first been arrested. There, he was given a false passport, and he left to cross the Austrian border. That particular step was so routine, and Fastenko felt himself so safe from pursuit, that he was guilty of an astonishing piece of carelessness. Having arrived at the border, and having turned in his passport to the official there, he suddenly discovered he could not remember his new name. What was he to do? There were forty passengers altogether, and the official had already begun to call off their names. Fastenko thought up a solution. He pretended to be asleep. He listened as the passports were handed back to their owners, and he noted that the name Makarov was called several times without anyone responding. But even at this point, he was not absolutely certain it was his name. Finally, the dragon of the imperial regime bent down to the underground revolution and politely tapped him on the shoulder. Mr. Makarov, Mr. Makarov, please, here is your passport. Fastenko headed for Paris. There he got to know Lenin and Lunachaski and carried out some administrative duties at the party school at Longjumeau. At the same time, he studied French, looked around him, and decided that he wanted to travel farther and see the world. Before the war, he went to Canada, where he worked for a while. 
and he spent some time in the United States as well. He was astonished by the free and easy, yet solidly established life in these countries, and he concluded that they would never have a proletarian revolution, and even that they hardly needed one. Then, in Russia, the long-awaited revolution came, sooner than expected, and everyone went back to Russia, and then there was one more revolution. Fastenko no longer felt his former passion for these revolutions, but he returned, compelled by the same need that urges birds to their annual migrations. Soon after Fastenko returned to the motherland, he was followed by a Canadian acquaintance, a former sailor on the battleship Potemkin, one of the mutineers, in fact, who had escaped to Canada and become a well-to-do farmer there. This former Potemkin sailor sold everything he owned, his farm and cattle, and returned to his native region with his money and his new tractor to help build sacred socialism. He enlisted in one of the first agricultural communes and donated his tractor to it. The tractor was driven any which way by whoever happened along and was quickly ruined. And the former Potemkin sailor saw things turning out very differently from the way he had pictured them for twenty years. Those in charge were incompetents, issuing orders that any sensible farmer could see were wild nonsense. In addition, he became skinnier and skinnier, and his clothes wore out, and nothing was left of the Canadian dollars he had exchanged for paper rubles. He begged to be allowed to leave with his family, and he crossed the border as poor as when he fled from the Potemkin. He crossed the ocean, just as he had done then, working his way as a sailor, because he had no money for passages. And back in Canada, he began life all over again as a hired hand on a farm. There was much about Fastenko I could not yet understand. In my eyes, perhaps the main thing about him, and the most surprising, was that he had known Lenin personally. Yet he was quite cool in recalling this. Such was my attitude at the time that when someone in the cell called Fastenko by his patronymic alone, without using his given name, in other words, simply Ilyich, asking, Ilyich, is it your turn to take out the latrine bucket? I was utterly outraged and offended, because it seemed sacrilege to me not only to use Lenin's patronymic in the same sentence as latrine bucket, but even to call anyone on earth Ilyich, except that one man, Lenin. For this reason, no doubt, there was much that Fastenko would have liked to explain to me that he still could not bring himself to. Nonetheless, he did say to me in the clearest Russian, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. But I failed to understand him. Observing my enthusiasm, he more than once said to me insistently, You're a mathematician. It's a mistake for you to forget that maxim of Descartes. Question everything. Question everything. What did this mean, everything? Certainly not everything. It seemed to me that I had questioned enough things as it was, and that was enough of that. Or, he said, hardly any of the old hard-labor political prisoners of Tsarist times are left. I am one of the last. All the hard-labor politicals have been destroyed, and they even dissolved our society in the thirties. Why? I asked. So we would not get together and discuss things. And although these simple words, spoken in a calm tone, should have been shouted to the heavens, should have shattered window panes, I understood them only as indicating one more of Stalin's evil deeds. It was a troublesome fact, but without roots. One thing is absolutely definite. Not everything that enters our ears penetrates our consciousness. Anything too far out of tune with our attitude is lost, either in the ears themselves or somewhere beyond, but it is lost. And even though I clearly remember Fastenko's many stories, I recall his opinions, but vaguely. He gave me the names of various books which he strongly advised me to read whenever I got back to freedom. In view of his age and his health, he evidently did not count on getting out of prison alive, and he got some satisfaction from hoping that I would some day understand his ideas. I couldn't write down the list of books he suggested, and even as it was, there was a great deal of prison life for me to remember, but I at least remembered those titles which were closest to my taste then, Untimely Thoughts by Gorky, 
whom I regarded very highly at that time, since he had, after all, outdone all the other classical Russian writers in being proletarian, and Plekhanov's A Year in the Motherland. Today, when I read what Plekhanov wrote on October the 28th, 1917, I can clearly reconstruct what Festenko himself thought. I am disappointed by the events of the last days, not because I do not desire the triumph of the working class in Russia, but precisely because I pray for it with all the strength of my soul. We must remember Engel's remark that there could be no greater historical tragedy for the working class than to seize political power when it is not ready for it. Such a seizure of power would compel it to retreat far back from the positions which were won in February and March of the present year. G. V. Plekhanov, an open letter to the workers of Petrograd, in the newspaper Yedinstvo, October the 28th, 1917. When Fastenko returned to Russia, pressure was put on him, out of respect for his old underground exploits, to accept an important position. But he did not want to. Instead, he accepted a modest post on the newspaper Pravda, and then a still more modest one, and eventually he moved over to the Moscow City Planning Office, where he worked in an inconspicuous job. I was surprised. Why had he chosen such a cul-de-sac? He explained in terms I found incomprehensible. You can't teach an old dog to live on a chain. Realizing that there was nothing he could accomplish, Fastenko quite simply wanted, in a very human way, to stay alive. He had already gotten used to living on a very small pension, not one of the personal pensions especially assigned by the government, because to have accepted that sort of thing would have called attention to his close ties to many who had been shot. And he might have managed to survive in this way until 1953. But, to his misfortune, they arrested another tenant in his apartment, a debauched, perpetually drunken writer, L. S. Blank V., who had bragged somewhere while he was drunk about owning a pistol. Owning a pistol meant an obligatory conviction for terrorism, and Fastenko, with his ancient social democratic past, was naturally the very picture of a terrorist. Therefore, the interrogator immediately proceeded to nail him for terrorism, and simultaneously, of course, for service in the French and Canadian intelligence services, and thus for service in the Tsarist Okhrana as well. This was one of Stalin's pet themes, to ascribe to every arrested Bolshevik, and in general to every arrested revolutionary, service in the Tsarist Okhrana. Was this merely his intolerant suspiciousness, or was it intuition, or perhaps analogy? And in 1945, to earn his fat pay, the fat interrogator was quite seriously leafing through the archives of the Tsarist provincial gendarmerie administrations and composing entirely serious interrogation depositions about conspiratorial nicknames, passwords, and secret rendezvous and meetings in 1903. On the tenth day, which was as soon as was permitted, his old wife, they had no children, delivered to Anatoly Ilyich such parcels as she could manage to put together, a piece of black bread weighing about ten and a half ounces. After all, it had been bought in the open market, where bread cost fifty rubles a pound, and a dozen peeled, boiled potatoes, which had been pierced by an awl when the parcel was being inspected. And the sight of those wretched and truly sacred parcels tore at one's heartstrings. That was what this human being had earned for sixty-three years of honesty and doubts. The four cots in our cell left an aisle in the middle where the table stood, but several days after my arrival they put a fifth person in with us and inserted a cot crosswise. They brought in the newcomer an hour before rising time, that brief, sweetly cerebral last hour, and three of us did not lift our heads. Only Kramarenko jumped up to sponge some tobacco and maybe with it some material for the interrogator. They began to converse in a whisper, and we tried not to listen. But it was quite impossible not to overhear the newcomer's whisper. It was so loud, so disquieting, so tense, and so close to a sob that we realized it was no ordinary grief that had entered our cell. The newcomer was asking whether many were shot, Nonetheless, without turning my head, I called them down, asking them to talk more quietly. When, on the signal to rise, we all instantly jumped up, 
Lying abed earned you the punishment cell. We saw a general, no less. True, he wasn't wearing any insignia of rank, not even tabs, nor could one see where his insignia had been torn off or unscrewed. But his expensive tunic, his soft overcoat, indeed his entire figure and face, told us that he was unquestionably a general, in fact a typical general, and most certainly a full general, and not one of your run-of-the-mill major generals. He was short, stocky, very broad of shoulder and body, and notably fat in the face. But this fat, which had been acquired by eating well, endowed him not with an appearance of good-natured accessibility, but with an air of weighty importance, of affiliation with the highest ranks. The crowning part of his face was, to be sure, not the upper portion, but the lower, which resembled a bulldog's jaw. It was there that his energy was concentrated, along with his will and authoritativeness, which were what had enabled him to attain such rank by early middle age. We introduced ourselves, and it turned out that L. V. Z. Blank v. was even younger than he appeared. He would be thirty-six that year. If they don't shoot me... Even more surprisingly, it developed that he was not a general at all, not even a colonel, and not even a military man, but an engineer. An engineer? I had grown up among engineers, and I could remember the engineers of the twenties very well indeed. Their open, shining intellects, their free and gentle humor, their agility and breadth of thought, the ease with which they shifted from one engineering field to another, and for that matter, from technology to social concerns and art. Then, too, they personified good manners and delicacy of taste, well-bred speech that flowed evenly and was free of uncultured words. One of them might play a musical instrument, another dabble in painting, and their faces always bore a spiritual imprint. From the beginning of the thirties I had lost contact with that milieu, then came the war, and here before me stood an engineer, one of those who had replaced those destroyed. No one could deny him one point of superiority. He was much stronger, more visceral than those others had been. His shoulders and hands retained their strength, even though they had not needed it for a long time. Freed from the restraints of courtesy, he stared sternly and spoke impersonally, as if he didn't even consider the possibility of a dissenting view. He had grown up differently from those others, too, and he worked differently. His father had ploughed the earth in the most literal sense. Lenya Z. Blank V. had been one of those dishevelled, unenlightened peasant boys whose wasted talents so distressed Berlinsky and Tolstoy. He was certainly no Lomonosov, and he could never have gotten to the academy on his own, but he was talented. If there had been no revolution, he would have ploughed the land, and he would have become well-to-do because he was energetic and active, and he might have raised himself into the merchant class. It being the Soviet period, however... He entered the Komsomol, and his work in the Komsomol, overshadowing his other talents, lifted him out of anonymity, out of his lowly state, out of the countryside, and shot him like a rocket through the workers' school, right into the Industrial Academy. He arrived there in 1929, at the very moment when those other engineers were being driven in whole herds into Gulag. It was urgently necessary for those in power to produce their own engineers, politically conscious, loyal, 100 percenters, who were to become bigwigs of production, Soviet businessmen, in fact, rather than people who did things themselves. That was the moment when the famous commanding heights overlooking the as-yet-uncreated industries were empty, and it was the fate of Z. Blank V.'s class in the Industrial Academy to occupy them. Z. Blank V.'s life became a chain of triumphs, a garland winding right up to the peak. Those were the exhausting years from 1929 to 1933, when the Civil War was being waged, not as in 1918 to 1920, with tachankas, machine guns mounted on horse-drawn carts, but with police dogs, when the long lines of those dying of famine trudged toward the railroad stations in the hope of getting to the cities, which is where the bread grains were evidently ripening but were refused tickets and were unable to leave and lay dying beneath the station fences in a submissive human heap of homespun coats and bark shoes. In those same years, Z. Blank V. not only did not know that bread was rationed to city dwellers, but 
At a time when a manual laborer was receiving 60 rubles a month in wages, he enjoyed a student's scholarship of 900 rubles a month. Z. Blank V.'s heart did not ache for the countryside whose dust he had shaken from his feet. His new life was already soaring elsewhere among the victors and the leaders. He never had time to be an ordinary run-of-the-mill foreman. He was immediately assigned to a position in which he had dozens of engineers and thousands of workers under him. He was the chief engineer of the big construction projects outside Moscow. From the very beginning of the war, he, of course, had an exemption from military service. He was evacuated to Alma-Ata, together with the department he worked for, and in this area he bossed even bigger construction projects on the Ili River. But in this case, his workers were prisoners. The sight of those little grey people bothered him very little at the time, nor did it inspire him to any reappraisals, nor compel him to take a closer look. In that gleaming orbit in which he circled, the only important thing was to achieve the projected totals, fulfilment of the plan. And it was quite enough for Z blank V merely to punish a particular construction unit, a particular camp, and a particular work superintendent. After that, it was up to them to manage to fulfill their norm with their own resources. How many hours they had to work to do it, or what ration they had to get along on, were details that didn't concern him. The war years deep in the rear were the best years in Z. Blank V's life. Such is the eternal and universal aspect of war. The more grief it accumulates at one of its poles, the more joy it generates at the other. Z. Blank V had not only a bulldog's jaw, but also a swift, enterprising, business-like grasp. With the greatest skill, he immediately switched to the economy's new wartime rhythm. Everything for victory, give and take, and the war will write it all off. He made just one small concession to the war. He got along without suits and neckties, and camouflaging himself in khaki color, had chrome leather boots made to order, and donned a general's tunic, the very one in which he appeared before us. That was fashionable and not uncommon at the time. It provoked neither anger in the war wounded, nor reproachful glances from women. Women usually looked at him with another sort of glance. They came to him to get well fed, to get warmed up, to have some fun. He had wild money passing through his hands. His billfold bulged like a little barrel with expense money, and to him ten rouble notes were like kopecks, and thousands like single roubles. Z blank V didn't hoard them, regret spending them, or keep count of them. He counted only the women who passed through his hands, and particularly those he had uncorked. This count was his sport. In the cell he assured us that his arrest had broken off the count at 290 plus, and he regretted that he had not reached 300. Since it was wartime and the women were alone and lonely, and since in addition to his power and money he had the virility of a Rasputin, one can probably believe him. And he was quite prepared to describe one episode after another. It was just that our ears were not prepared to listen to him. Even though no danger threatened him during those last years, he had frantically grabbed these women, messed them up, and then thrown them away like a greedy diner eating boiled crayfish, grabbing one, devouring it, sucking it, then grabbing the next. He was so accustomed to the malleability of material to his own vigorous boar-like drive across the land. Whenever he was especially agitated, he would dash about the cell like a powerful boar who might just knock down an oak tree in his path. He was so accustomed to an environment in which all the leaders were his own kind of people, in which one could always make a deal, work things out, cover them up. He forgot that the more success one gains, the more envy one arouses. As he found out during his interrogation, a dossier had been accumulating against him since way back in 1936 on the basis of an anecdote he had carelessly told at a drunken party. More denunciations had followed, and more testimony from agents. After all, one has to take women to restaurants where all types of people see you. Another report pointed out that he had been in no hurry to leave Moscow in 1941, that he had been waiting for the Germans. He had, in actual fact, stayed on longer than he should have, apparently because of some woman. 
Z blank B took great care to keep his business deals clean, but he quite forgot the existence of Article 58. Nonetheless, the avalanche might not have overwhelmed him had he not grown overconfident and refused to supply building materials for a certain prosecutor's dasher. That was what caused his dormant case to awaken and tremble and start rolling. And this was one more instance of the fact that cases begin with the material self-interest of the blue boys. The scope of Z. Blank B.'s concepts of the world can be judged by the fact that he believed there was a Canadian language. During the course of two months in the cell, he did not read a single book, not even a whole page. And if he did read a paragraph, it was only to be distracted from his gloomy thoughts about his interrogation. It was clear from his conversation that he had read even less in freedom. He knew of Pushkin as the hero of bawdy stories. And of Tolstoy, he knew only, in all probability, that he was a deputy of the Supreme Soviet. On the other hand, was he a 100% loyal communist? Was he that same socially conscious proletarian who had been brought up to replace Palchinsky and von Meck and their ilk? This was what was really surprising. He was most certainly not. We once discussed the whole course of the war with him, and I said that from the very first moment I had never had any doubts about our victory over the Germans. He looked at me sharply. He did not believe me. Come on, what are you saying? And then he took his head in his hands. Oh, Sasha, Sasha, and I was convinced the Germans would win. That's what did me in. There you are. He was one of the organizers of victory, but each day he believed in the Germans' success and awaited their inevitable arrival. Not because he loved them, but simply because he had so sober an insight into our economy, which I, of course, knew nothing about and therefore believed in. All of us in the cell were deeply depressed, but none of us was so crushed as Z blank V. None took his arrest as so profound a tragedy. He learned from us that he would get no more than a tenor, that during his years in camp he would, of course, be a work superintendent, and that he would not have to experience real suffering, as indeed he never did. But this did not comfort him in the least. He was too stricken by the collapse of such a glorious life. After all, it was his one and only life on earth, and no one else's, which had interested him all his thirty-six years. And more than once, sitting on his cot in front of the table, propping his pudgy head on his short pudgy arm, he would start to sing quietly, in a sing-song voice, and with lost, befogged eyes. Forgotten and abandoned since my young, early years, I was left a tiny orphan. He could never get any further than that. At that point, he would break into explosive sobs. All that bursting strength which could not break through the walls that enclosed him he turned inward toward self-pity, and toward pity for his wife. Every tenth day, since oftener was not allowed, his wife, long since unloved, brought him rich and bountiful food parcels, the whitest of white bread, butter, red caviar, veal, sturgeon. He would give her each of us a sandwich and a twist of tobacco, and then bend down to the provisions he had set before himself, delighting in odors and colors, that contrasted vividly with the bluish potatoes of the old underground revolutionary Fastenko. Then his tears would start to pour again, redoubled. He recalled out loud his wife's tears, whole years of tears, some due to love notes she had found in his trousers, some to some woman's underpants in his overcoat pocket, stuffed there hurriedly in his automobile and forgotten. And when he was thus torn by burning self-pity, his armor of evil energy fell away, and before us was a ruined and clearly a good person. I was astonished that he could sob so. The Estonian Arnold Susi, our cellmate with the gray bristles in his hair, explained it to me. Cruelty is invariably accompanied by sentimentality. It is the law of complementaries. For example, in the case of the Germans, the combination is a national trait... Pastenko, on the other hand, was the most cheerful person in the cell, even though, in view of his age, he was the only one who could not count on surviving and returning to freedom. Flinging an arm around my shoulders, he would say, To stand up for the truth is nothing. For truth you have to sit, 
in jail. Or else he taught me to sing this song from Tsarist hard labor days. And if we have to perish in mines and prisons wet, our cause will ever find renown in future generations yet. And I believe this. May these pages help his faith come true. The sixteen-hour days in our cell were short on outward events, but they were so interesting that I, for example, now find a mere sixteen minutes' wait for a trolley bus much more boring. There were no events worthy of attention, and yet by evening I would sigh, because once more there had been not enough time. Once more the day had flown. The events were trivial, but for the first time in my life I learned to look at them through a magnifying glass. The most difficult hours in the day were the first two, at the rattle of the key in the lock, for at the Lubyanka there were no swill troughs, and it was necessary to unlock the door even to shout time to get up. We jumped up without lingering, made our beds and sat down on them, feeling empty and helpless, with the electric light still burning. Special large openings in the cell doors of many Russian prisons, known to the prisoners as kormushki, meaning swill troughs or fodder bins. Their lids dropped down to make tiny tables. Conversations with the jailers were carried on through these openings, food was handed through, and prison papers were shoved through for the prisoners to sign. This enforced wakefulness from 6 a.m. on, at a time when the brain was still lazy from sleep, the whole world seemed repulsive and all of life wrecked, and there was not a gulp of air in the cell, was particularly ludicrous for those who had been under interrogation all night and had only just been able to get to sleep. But don't try to steal extra sleep. If you should try to doze off, leaning slightly against the wall or propped over the table as if studying the chessboard, or relaxing over a book lying conspicuously open on your knees, the key would sound a warning knock on the door, or worse yet, the door with that rattling lock would suddenly open silently, since the Lubyanka jailers were specially trained to do just that. And like a spirit passing through a wall, the swift and silent shadow of the junior sergeant would take three steps into the cell, hook on to you as you slept, and maybe take you off to the punishment cell. Or maybe they would take book privileges away from the whole cell or deprive everyone of their daily walk. A cruel, unjust punishment for all, and there were other punishments, too, in the black lines of the prison regulations. Read them. They hang in every cell. If, incidentally, you needed glasses to read, then you wouldn't be reading books or the sacred regulations either during those two starving hours. Eyeglasses were taken away every night, and it was evidently still dangerous for you to have them during those two hours when no one brought anything to the cell and no one came to it. No one asked about anything and no one was summoned. The interrogators were still sleeping sweetly. And the prison administration was just opening its eyes, coming to. Only the Vertukhai, the turnkeys, were active and energetic, opening the peephole cover once a minute for inspection. During my time, this word Vertukhai had already come into wide currency for the jailers. It was said to have originated with Ukrainian guards who were always ordering, Stoy, Tane Vertukhais! And yet it is also worth recording the English word for jailer, turnkey, is vertikluch in Russian. Perhaps a vertukai here in Russia is also one who turns the key. But one procedure was carried out during those two hours, the morning trip to the toilet. When the guard roused us, he made an important announcement. He designated the person from our cell who was to be entrusted with the responsibility of carrying out the latrine bucket. In more isolated, ordinary prisons, the prisoners had enough freedom of speech and self-government to decide this question themselves, but in the chief political prison, such an important event could not be left to chance. So then you formed up in single file, hands behind your backs, and at the head of the line, the responsible latrine bucket bearer carried, chest high, the two-gallon tin pail with a lid on it. When you reached your goal, you were locked in again, each having first been handed a small piece of paper the size of two railway tickets. At the Lubyanka, this was not particularly interesting. The paper was blank and white. But there were enticing prisons where they gave you pages of books and what reading that was. You could try to guess whence it came, read it over on both sides, digest the contents, evaluate the style. And when words had been cut in half, that was particularly essential. 
You could trade with your comrades. In some places they handed out pages from the once progressive Granat Encyclopedia. And sometimes it's awful to say it from the classics. And I don't mean belles lettres either. Visits to the toilet thus became a means of acquiring knowledge. But there's not that much to laugh at. We are dealing with that crude necessity which is considered unsuitable to refer to in literature, although there too it has been said with immortal adroitness, Blessed is he who early in the morning. This allegedly natural start of the prison day set a trap for the prisoner that would grip him all day, a trap for his spirit, which was what hurt. Given the lack of physical activity in prison and the meagre food and the muscular relaxation of sleep, a person was just not able to square accounts with nature immediately after rising. Then they quickly returned you to the cell and locked you up until 6 p.m., or in some prisons, until morning. At that point you would start to get worried and worked up by the approach of the daytime interrogation period and the events of the day itself and you would be loading yourself up with your bread ration and water and gruel. But no one was going to let you visit that glorious accommodation again, easy access to which free people are incapable of appreciating. This debilitating, banal need could make itself felt day after day, shortly after the morning toilet trip, and would then torment you the whole day long, oppress you, rob you of the inclination to talk, read, think, and even of any desire to eat the meagre food. People in the cells sometimes discussed how the Lubyanka system and schedule, and those in other prisons as well, had come into being, whether through calculated brutality or as a matter of chance. My opinion is that both factors are involved. The rising time is obviously a matter of malicious intent, but much of the rest evolved automatically at first, which is true of many of the brutalities of life generally and was then discovered by the powers that be to be useful and was therefore made permanent. The shifts change at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., and it was more convenient for everyone to take the prisoners to the toilet at the end of a shift. Letting them out singly in the middle of the day was extra trouble and meant extra precautions, and no one got paid for that. The same was true of the business with eyeglasses. Why should one worry about that at 6 a.m.? they could be returned to the owners just before the end of the shift instead. So now we heard them being brought around. Doors were being opened. We could guess whether someone wore them in the cell next door. And didn't your co-defendant wear spectacles? But we didn't feel up to knocking out a message on the wall. This was punished very severely. A moment later they would bring the eyeglasses to our cell. Pastenko used them only for reading, but Susi needed them all the time. He could stop squinting once he'd put them on. Thanks to his horn-rimmed glasses and straight lines above the eyes, his face became severe, perspicacious, exactly the face of an educated man of our century as we might picture it to ourselves. Back before the Revolution, he had studied at the Faculty of History and Philology of the University of Petrograd, and throughout his twenty years in independent Estonia, he had preserved intact the purest Russian speech, which he spoke like a native. Later, in Tartu, he had studied law. In addition to Estonian, he spoke English and German, and through all these years he continued to read the London Economist and the German scientific Berichter summaries. He had studied the constitutions and the codes of law of various countries, and in our cell he represented Europe worthily and with restraint. He had been a leading lawyer in Estonia, and been known as Kurzu meaning golden-tongued. There was new activity in the corridor. A freeloader in a grey smock, a husky young fellow who had certainly not been at the front, brought a tray with our five bread rations and ten lumps of sugar. Our cell stoolie hovered over them, even though we would inevitably cast lots for them, which we did because every least detail of this was important. The heel of the loaf, for instance and the number of smaller pieces needed to make the total weight come out right, and how the crust adheres, or doesn't, to the inside of the bread. And it was better that fate should decide. Where, indeed, in our country did this casting of lots not happen? It was the result of our universal and endless hunger. In the army, all rations were divided up the same way, and the Germans, who could hear what was going on from their trenches, teased us about it. 
Who gets it? The political commissar? But the stoolie felt he just had to hold everything in his hands for at least a second so that some bread and sugar molecules would cling to his palms. That pound of unrisen wet bread with its swamp-like sogginess of texture made half with potato flour was our crutch and the main event of the day. Life had begun. The day had begun. This was when it began. And everyone had countless problems. Had he allocated his bread ration wisely the day before? Should he cut it with a thread or break it up greedily or slowly, quietly nip off pieces one by one? Should he wait for tea or pile into it right now? Should he leave some for dinner or finish it off at lunch? And how much? In addition to these wretched dilemmas, what wide-ranging discussions and arguments went on, for our tongues had been liberated and with bread we were once more men, provoked by this one-pound chunk in our hand, consisting more of water than of grain. Incidentally, Fastenko explained that the workers of Moscow were eating the very same bread at that time. And generally speaking, was there any real bread grain in this bread at all? And what additives were in it? There was at least one person in every cell who knew all about additives, for after all, who hadn't eaten them during these past decades? Discussions and reminiscences began about the white bread they had baked back in the twenties, springy, round loaves like sponge cake inside, with a buttery, reddish-brown top crust and a bottom crust that still had a trace of ash from the coals of the hearth. That bread had vanished for good. Those born in 1930 would never know what bread is. Friends, this is a forbidden subject. We agreed not to say one word about food. Once again there was movement in the corridor. Tea was being brought around. A new young tough in a grey smock carrying pails. We put our teapot out in the corridor and he poured straight into it from a pail without a spout, into the teapot and onto the runner and the floor beneath it and the whole corridor was polished like that of a first-class hotel. Soon the biologist Timofey Fresovsky, whom I have already mentioned, would be brought here from Berlin. There was nothing at the Lubyanka, it appeared, which so offended him as this spilling on the floor. He considered it striking evidence of the lack of professional pride on the part of the jailers and of all of us in our chosen work. He multiplied the twenty-seven years of Lubyanka's existence as a prison by seven hundred and thirty times, twice for each day of the year, and then by one hundred and eleven cells, and he would seethe for a long time because it was easier to spill boiling water on the floor two million one hundred and eighty-eight thousand times and then come and wipe it up with a rag the same number of times than to make pails with spouts. And that was all they gave us. Whatever cooked food we got would be served at 1 p.m. and at 4 p.m., one meal almost on the heels of the other. You could then spend the next 21 hours remembering it. And that wasn't prison brutality either. It was simply a matter of the kitchen staff having to do its work as quickly as possible and leave. At 9 o'clock, the morning check-up took place. For a long while beforehand, we could hear especially loud turns of the key and particularly sharp knocks on the doors. Then one of the duty lieutenants for the whole floor would march forward and enter, almost as erect as if he were standing at attention. He would take two steps forward and look sternly at us. We would be on our feet. We didn't even dare remember that political prisoners were once not required to rise. It was no work at all to count us. He could do it in a glance. But this was a moment for testing our rights. For we did have some rights, after all, although we did not really know them, and it was his job to hide them from us. The whole strength of the Lubyanka training showed itself in a totally machine-like manner. No expression on the face, no inflection, not a superfluous word. And which of our rights did we know about? A request to have our shoes repaired, an appointment with the doctor. Although if they actually took you to the doctor, you would not be happy about the consequences. There, the machine-like Lubyanka manner would be particularly striking. He didn't ask, what's your trouble? That would take too many words, and one couldn't pronounce the phrase without any inflection. He would ask curtly, troubles? And if you began to talk at too great length about your ailment, he would cut you off. It was clear, anyway. A toothache? Extracted. You could have arsenic. 
a filling. We don't fill teeth here. That would have required additional appointments and created a somewhat humane atmosphere. The prison doctor was the interrogator's and executioner's right-hand man. The beaten prisoner would come to on the floor only to hear the doctor's voice. You can continue. The pulse is normal. After a prisoner's five days and nights in a punishment cell, the doctor inspects the frozen naked body and says, You can continue. If a prisoner is beaten to death, he signs the death certificate, cirrhosis of the liver, or coronary occlusion. He gets an urgent call to a dying prisoner in a cell, and he takes his time, and whoever behaves differently is not kept on in the prison. Dr. F. P. Gartz would have earned nothing extra in our country. But our Stooley was better informed about his rights. According to him, he had already been under interrogation eleven months, and he was taken to interrogation only during the day. He spoke up and asked for an appointment with the prison chief. What, the chief of the whole Lubyanka? Yes, his name was taken down. And in the evening, after taps, when the interrogators were already in their offices, he was summoned, and he returned with some makoka. This was very crude, of course, but so far they had not been able to think up anything better. It would have been a big expense to convert entirely to microphones in the walls, and impossible to listen in on all 111 cells for whole days at a time. Who would do it? Stool pigeons were cheaper, and would continue to be used for a long time to come. But Kramarenko had a hard time with us. Sometimes he eavesdropped so hard that the sweat poured from him, and we could see from his face that he didn't understand what we were saying. There was one additional right, the privilege of writing applications and petitions, which replaced freedom of the press, of assembly, and of the ballot, all of which we had lost when we left freedom. Twice a month the morning duty officer asked, Who wants to write a petition? and they listed everyone who wanted to. In the middle of the day, they would lead you to an individual box and lock you up in it. In there, you could write whomever you pleased, the father of the peoples, the central committee of the party, the supreme Soviet, Minister Beria, Minister Abakumov, the general prosecutor, the chief military prosecutor, the prison administration, the investigation department. You could complain about your arrest, your interrogator, even the chief of the prison. In each and every case, your petition would have no effect whatever. It would not be stapled into any file, and the most senior official to read it would be your own interrogator. However, you were in no position to prove this. In fact, it was rather more likely that he would not read it, because no one would be able to read it on a piece of paper measuring seven by ten centimeters, in other words, three by four inches, a little larger than the paper given you each morning at the toilet, with a pen broken in the middle or bent into a hook, and an inkwell with pieces of rag in it and ink diluted with water. You would just be able to scratch out, Petit, then the letters would all run together on the cheap paper, Eon couldn't be worked into the line, and everything would come through on the other side of the sheet. You might have still other rights, but the duty officer would keep quiet about them. And you wouldn't be losing much, truth to tell, even if you didn't find out about them. The check-up came and went, and the day began. The interrogators were already arriving there somewhere. The turnkey would summon one of us with a great air of secrecy. He called out the first letter of the name only, like this. Whose name begins with S? And whose name begins with F? Or perhaps, whose begins with M? With Am? and you yourself had to be quick-witted enough to recognize that it was you he wanted and offer yourself as a victim. This system was introduced to prevent mistakes on the jailer's part. He might have called out a name in the wrong cell, and that way we might have found out who else was in prison. And yet, though cut off from the entire prison, we were not deprived of news from other cells. Because they tried to crowd in as many prisoners as possible, they shuffled them about from cell to cell, and every newcomer brought all his accumulated experience to his new cell. Thus it was that we, imprisoned on the fourth floor, knew all about the cellar cells, about the boxes on the first floor, about the darkness on the second floor, where the women were all kept, about the split-level arrangement of the fifth, and about the biggest cell of all on the fifth floor, 
number 111. Before my time, the children's writer Bondarin had been a prisoner in our cell, and before that he had been on the women's floor with some Polish correspondent or other, who had previously been a cellmate of Field Marshal von Paulus, and that was how we learned all the details about von Paulus. The period for being summoned to interrogation passed, and for those left in the cell, a long, pleasant day stretched ahead, lightened by opportunities, and not overly darkened by duties. Duties could include sterilizing the cots with a blow torch twice a month. At the Lubyanka, matches were categorically forbidden to prisoners. To get a light for a cigarette, we had to signal patiently with a finger when the peephole was opened, thus asking the jailer for a light. But blow torches were entrusted to us without hesitation. And once a week we might be called into the corridor to have our faces clipped with a dull clipper, allegedly a right but strongly resembling a duty. And one might be signed the duty of cleaning the parquet floor in the cell. Z. Blank V. always avoided this work because it was beneath his dignity, like any other work, in fact. We got out of breath quickly because we were underfed. Otherwise, we would have considered this duty a privilege. It was such gay, lively work, pushing the brush forward with one's bare foot, torso pulled back, and then turn about. Forward, back, forward, back, and forget all your grief. Shiny as a mirror, a Potemkin prison. Besides, we didn't have to go on being overcrowded in our old cell 67 any longer. In the middle of March, they added a sixth prisoner to our number, and since here in the Lubyanka they did not fill all the cells with board bunks, nor make you sleep on the floor, they transferred all of us into a beauty of a cell, number 53. I would advise anyone who has not yet been in it to pay it a visit. This was not a cell. It was a palace chamber set aside as a sleeping apartment for distinguished travelers. The Rossiya Insurance Company, without a thought for economy, had raised the height of the ceiling in this wing to sixteen and a half feet. This company acquired a piece of Moscow earth that was well acquainted with blood. The innocent Vereshchagin was torn to pieces in 1812 on Filkosovsky, near the Rostopchin house. And the murderess and serf owner Saltichika lived and killed serfs on the other side of the Bolshaya Lubyanka. In Moscow, edited by N.A. Gainika, and others, Moscow, Sabashnikov Publishers, 1917, page 231. Oh, what four-story bunks the chief of counterintelligence at the front would have slapped in here, and he could have gotten 100 people in, results guaranteed. And the window, it was such an enormous window that standing on its sill, the jailer could hardly reach the fortochka, that hinged ventilation pane. One section of this window alone would have made a fine whole window in an ordinary house. Only the riveted steel sheets of the muzzle closing off four-fifths of it reminded us that we were not in a palace after all. Nonetheless, on clear days, above this muzzle, from the wall of the Lubyanka courtyard, from some window pane or other on the sixth or seventh floor, we now and then got a pale reflection of a ray of sunlight. To us it was a real ray of sunlight, a living, dear being. We followed with affection its climb up the wall, and every step it made was filled with meaning, presaging the time of our daily outing in the fresh air, counting off several half-hours before lunch. Then, just before lunch, it disappeared. And our rights included being let out for a walk, reading books, telling one another about the past, listening and learning arguing and being educated. And we would be rewarded by a lunch that included two courses. Too good to be true. The walk was bad on the first three floors of the Lubyanka. The prisoners were let out into a damp, low-lying little courtyard, the bottom of a narrow well between the prison buildings. But the prisoners on the fourth and fifth floors, on the other hand, were taken to an eagle's perch on the roof of the fifth floor. It had a concrete floor, there were concrete walls, three times the height of a man. We were accompanied by an unarmed jailer. On the watchtower was a sentinel with an automatic weapon. But the air was real, and the sky was real. And behind your back, line up in pairs, no talking, no stopping. Such were the commands, but they forgot to forbid us to throw back our heads. 
and of course we did just that. Here one could see not a reflected, not a second-hand sun, but the real one, the real eternally living sun itself, or its golden diffusion through the spring clouds. Spring promises everyone happiness, and tenfold to the prisoner. Oh, April sky! It didn't matter that I was in prison. Evidently they were not going to shoot me, and in the end I would become wiser here. I would come to understand many things here, heaven... I would correct my mistakes yet, O oh heaven, not for them, but for you, heaven. I had come to understand those mistakes here, and I would correct them. As if from a pit, from the far-off lower reaches, from Dzerzhinsky Square, the hoarse, earthly singing of the automobile horns rose to us in a constant refrain. To those who were dashing along to the tune of those honkings, they seemed the trumpets of creation, but from here their insignificance was very clear. The walk in the fresh air lasted only twenty minutes, but how much there was about it to concern oneself with, how much one had to accomplish while it lasted. In the first place, it was very interesting to try to figure out the layout of the entire prison while they were taking you there and back, and to calculate where those tiny hanging courtyards were, so that at some later date, out in freedom, one could walk along the square and spot their location. We made many turns on the way there, and I invented the following system. Starting from the cell itself, I would count every turn to the right as plus one, and every turn to the left as minus one. And no matter how quickly they made us turn, the idea was not to try to picture it hastily to oneself, but to count up the total. If, in addition, through some staircase window, you could catch a glimpse of the backs of the Lubyanka water nymphs, half reclining against the pillared turret which hovered over the square itself, and you could remember the exact point in your count when this happened... Then, back in the cell, you could orient yourself and figure out what your own window looked out on. And during that outdoor walk, you concentrated on breathing as much fresh air as possible. There, too, alone beneath that bright heaven, you had to imagine your bright future life, sinless and without error. There, too, was the best place of all to talk about the most dangerous subjects. It didn't matter that conversation during the walk was forbidden. One simply had to know how to manage it. The compensation was that in all likelihood you could not be overheard, either by a stoolie or by a microphone. During these walks I tried to get into a pair with Susie. We talked together in the cell, but we liked to try talking about the main things here. We hadn't come together quickly, it took some time, but he had already managed to tell me a great deal. I acquired a new capability from him, to accept patiently and purposefully things that had never had any place in my own plans and had, it seemed, no connection at all with the clearly outlined direction of my life. From childhood on, I had somehow known that my objective was the history of the Russian Revolution and that nothing else concerned me. To understand the revolution, I had long since required nothing beyond Marxism. I cut myself off from everything else that came up and turned my back on it. And now fate brought me together with Susie. He breathed a completely different sort of air, and he would tell me passionately about his own interests, and these were Estonia and democracy. And although I had never expected to become interested in Estonia, much less bourgeois democracy, I nevertheless kept listening and listening to his loving stories of twenty free years in that modest, work-loving, small nation of big men whose ways were slow and set. I listened to the principles of the Estonian Constitution, which had been borrowed from the best of European experience, and to how their hundred-member one-house parliament had worked. And though the why of it wasn't clear, I began to like it all and store it all away in my experience. Susie remembered me later as a strange mixture of Marxist and Democrat. Yes, things were wildly mixed up inside me at that time. I listened willingly to their fatal history. The tiny Estonian anvil had, from way, way back, been caught between two hammers, the Teutons and the Slavs. Blows showered on it from east and west in turn. There was no end to it, and there still isn't. And there was the well-known, totally unknown, story of how we Russians wanted to take them over in one fell swoop in 1918, but they refused to yield. And how, later on, 
Udenich spoke contemptuously of their Finnish heritage, and we ourselves christened them White Guard Bandits. Then the Estonian gymnasium students enrolled as volunteers. We struck at Estonia again in 1940, and again in 1941, and again in 1944. Some of their sons were conscripted by the Russian army, and others by the German army, and still others ran off into the woods. The elderly Tallinn intellectuals discussed how they might break out of that iron ring, break away somehow, and live for themselves and by themselves. Their premier might possibly have been Tief, and their minister of education, say, Susi. But neither Churchill nor Roosevelt cared about them in the least. But Uncle Joe did. And during the very first nights after the Soviet armies entered Tallinn, all these dreamers were seized in their Tallinn apartments. Fifteen of them were imprisoned in various cells of the Moscow Lubyanka, one in each, and were charged under Article 58.2 with the criminal desire for national self-determination. Each time we returned to the cell from our walk was like being arrested again. Even in our very special cell, the air seemed stifling after the outdoors, and it would have been good to have a snack afterward, too. But it was best not to think about it, not at all. It was bad if one of the prisoners who received food parcels tactlessly spread out his treasures at the wrong time and began to eat. All right, we'll develop self-control. It was bad, too, to be betrayed by the author of the book you were reading, if he began to drool over food in the greatest detail. Get away from me, Gogol. Get away from me, Chekhov, too. They both had too much food in their books. He didn't really feel like eating, but nevertheless he ate a helping of veal and drank some beer. The son of a bitch. It was better to read spiritual things. Dostoevsky was the right kind of author for prisoners to read. Yet even in Dostoevsky you could find that passage. The children went hungry. For several days they had seen nothing but bread and sausage. The Lubyanka Library was the prisoner's principal ornament. True, the librarian was repulsive, a blonde spinster with a horsey build, who did everything possible to make herself ugly. Her face was so whitened that it looked like a doll's immobile mask. Her lips were purple, and her plucked eyebrows were black. You might say that, that was her own business, but we would have enjoyed it more if she had been a charmer. However, perhaps the chief of the Lubyanka had already taken that into consideration. But here was a wonder. Once every ten days, when she came to take away our books, she listened to our requests for new ones. She heard us out in that same machine-like, inhuman Lubyanka manner, and it was impossible to judge whether she had heard the author's names or the titles, whether indeed she had heard our words at all. She would leave, and we would experience several hours of nervous but happy expectation. During those hours, all the books we had returned were leafed through and checked. They were examined in case we had left pinpricks or dots underneath certain letters, for there was such a method of clandestine intramural communication, or we had underlined passages we liked with a fingernail. We were worried, even though we were totally innocent. They might come to us and say that they had discovered pinpricks. They were always right, of course, and as always no proof was required. And on that basis we could be deprived of books for three months if indeed they didn't put the whole cell on a punishment cell regime. It would be very sad to have to do without books during the best and brightest of our prison months before we were tossed into the pit of camp. Indeed, we were not only afraid, we actually trembled, just as we had in youth after sending a love letter, while we waited for an answer. Will it come or not? And what will it say? Then at last the books arrived and determined the pattern of the next ten days, they would decide whether we would chiefly concentrate on reading or, if they had brought us trash, be spending more time in conversation. They brought exactly as many books as there were people in the cell, this being the sort of calculation appropriate to a bread cutter and not a librarian. One book for one person, six books for six persons. The cells with the largest number of prisoners were the best off. Sometimes the spinster would fill our orders miraculously, but even when she was careless about them, things could turn out interestingly. Because the library of the big Lubyanka was unique, in all probability it had been assembled out of confiscated private libraries. 
The bibliophiles who had collected those books had already rendered up their souls to God. But the main thing was that while state security had been busy censoring and emasculating all the libraries of the nation for decades, it forgot to dig in its own bosom. Here, in its very den, one could read Zamyatin, Pilniak, Pantelaimon Romanov, and any volume at all of the complete works of Merezhovsky. Some people wisecracked that they allowed us to read forbidden books because they already regarded us as dead. But I myself think that the Lubyanka librarians hadn't the faintest concept of what they were giving us. They were simply lazy and ignorant. We used to read intensively during the hours before lunch, but it sometimes happened that a single phrase would get you going and drive you to pace from window to door, from door to window, and you would want to show somebody what you had read and explain what it implied, and then an argument would get started. It was a time for sharp arguments as well. I often argued with Yuri Y. On that March morning, when they led the five of us into palatial cell 53, they had just added a sixth prisoner to our group. He entered, it seemed, like a spirit, and his shoes made no noise against the floor. He entered, and, not sure that he could stay on his feet, leaned against the door frame. The bulb had been turned off in the cell, and the morning light was dim. However, the newcomer did not have his eyes wide open. He squinted, and he kept silent. The cloth of his military field jacket and trousers did not identify him as coming from the Soviet or the German or the Polish or the English army. The structure of his face was elongated. There was very little Russian in it. And he was painfully thin. And not only very thin, but very tall. We spoke to him in Russian, and he kept silent. Susi addressed him in German. He still kept silent. Fastenko tried French and English with the same result. Only gradually did a smile appear on his emaciated, yellow, half-dead face, the only such smile I had ever seen in my life. People, he uttered weakly, as if he were coming out of a faint, or as if he had been waiting all night long to be executed, and he reached out his weak, emaciated hand. It held a small bundle tied up in a rag. Our stooley understood instantly what was in it, threw himself on it, grabbed it, and opened it up on the table. There was half a pound of light tobacco. He had instantly managed to roll himself a cigarette four times the size of an ordinary one. Thus, after three weeks' confinement in a cellar box, Yuri Nikolaevich Y. made his appearance in our cell. From the time of the 1929 incidents on the Chinese Eastern Railroad, the song had been sung throughout the land its steel breast brushing aside our enemies, the 27th stands on guard. The chief of artillery of this 27th Infantry Division, formed back in the Civil War, was the Tsarist officer Nikolai Y. I remember the name because it was the name of one of the authors of our artillery textbook. In a heated freight car that had been converted into living quarters, and always accompanied by his wife, this artillery officer had crossed and recrossed the Volga and the Urals, sometimes moving east and sometimes west. It was in this heated freight car that his son, Yuri, born in 1917, and twin brother, therefore, of the revolution itself, spent his first years. That was a long time ago. Since then, his father had settled in Leningrad in the academy and lived well and frequented high circles, and the son graduated from the officer candidate school. During the Finnish war, Yuri wanted desperately to fight for the motherland, and friends of his father got him an appointment as an aide on an army staff. Yuri did not have to crawl on his stomach to destroy the Finns' concrete artillery emplacements, nor get trapped and encircled on a scouting mission, nor freeze in the snow under sniper bullets. But his service was nevertheless rewarded, not with some ordinary decoration, but with the Order of the Red Banner, which fitted neatly on his field shirt. Thus he completed the Finnish war in full consciousness of its justice and his own part in it. But he didn't have things so easy in the next war. The battery he commanded was surrounded near Luka. They scattered and were caught and driven off into prisoner-of-war camps. Yuri found himself in a concentration camp for officers near Vilnius. In every life, 
there is one particular event that is decisive for the entire person, for his fate, his convictions, his passions. Two years in that camp shook Yuri up once and for all. It is impossible to catch with words or to circumvent with syllogisms what that camp was. That was a camp to die in, and whoever did not die was compelled to reach certain conclusions. Among those who could survive were the ordiners, the internal camp police or polizai, chosen from among the prisoners. Of course, Yuri did not become an ordiner. The cooks managed to survive too. The translators could survive also. They needed them. But though Yuri had a superb command of conversational German, he concealed this fact. He realized that a translator would have to betray his fellow prisoners. One could also postpone dying by digging graves, but others stronger and more dexterous got those jobs. Yuri announced that he was an artist, and actually, as part of his varied education at home, he had been given lessons in painting. Yuri didn't paint badly in oils, and only his desire to follow in his father's footsteps, for he had been proud of his father, had kept him from entering art school. Together with an elderly artist, I regret that I don't remember his name, he occupied a separate room in the barracks, and there Yuri painted for nothing schmaltzy pictures such as Nero's Feast and the Chorus of Elves and the like for the German officers on the commandant's staff. In return, he was given food. The slops for which the POW officers stood in line with their mess tins from 6 a.m. on, while the ordiners beat them with sticks and the cooks with ladles. Were not enough to sustain life. At evening, Yuri could see from the windows of their room the one and only picture for which his artistic talent had been given him: the evening mist hovering above a swampy meadow encircled by barbed wire, a multitude of bonfires, and around the bonfires beings who had once been Russian officers, but had now become beast-like creatures who gnawed the bones of dead horses, who baked patties from potato rinds. Who smoked manure and were all swarming with lice. Not all those two-legged creatures had died as yet. Not all of them had yet lost the capacity for intelligible speech. And one could see in the crimson reflections of the bonfires how a belated understanding was dawning on those faces, which were descending to the Neanderthal. Wormwood on the tongue. That life which Yuri had preserved was no longer precious to him for its own sake. He was not one of those who easily agree to forget. No, if he was going to survive, he was obliged to draw certain conclusions. It was already clear to them that the Germans were not the heart of the matter, or at least not the Germans alone. That among the POWs of many nationalities, only the Soviets lived like this and died like this. None were worse off than the Soviets. Even the Poles, even the Yugoslavs, existed in far more tolerable conditions. And as for the English and the Norwegians, they were inundated by the International Red Cross with parcels from home. They didn't even bother to line up for the German rations. Wherever there were Allied POW camps next door, their prisoners, out of kindness, threw our men handouts over the fence, and our prisoners jumped on these gifts like a pack of dogs on a bone. The Russians were carrying the whole war on their shoulders, and this was the Russian lot. Why? Gradually, explanations came in from here and there. It turned out that the USSR did not recognize as binding Russia's signature to the Hague Convention on War Prisoners. That meant that the USSR accepted no obligations at all in the treatment of war prisoners, and took no steps for the protection of its own soldiers who had been captured. We did not recognize that 1907 convention until 1955. Incidentally, in his diary for 1915, Melgunov reports rumors that Russia would not let aid go through for its prisoners in Germany, and that their living conditions were worse than those of all other Allied prisoners. Simply in order to prevent rumors about the good life of war prisoners inducing our soldiers to surrender willingly, there was some sort of continuity of ideas here. Melgunov, Volume One, pages 199 and 203. The USSR did not recognize the International Red Cross. The USSR did not recognize its own soldiers of the day before. It did not intend to give them any help as POWs. 
At the heart of Yuri, enthusiastic twin of the October Revolution, grew cold. In their barracks room, he and the elderly artist clashed and argued. It was difficult for Yuri to accept. Yuri resisted. But the old man kept peeling off layer after layer. What was it all about? Stalin. But wasn't it too much to ascribe everything to Stalin, to those stubby hands? He who draws a conclusion only halfway fails to draw it at all. What about the rest of them, the ones right next to Stalin and below him, and everywhere around the country, all those whom the motherland had authorized to speak for it? What is the right course of action if our mother has sold us to the gypsies? No, even worse, thrown us to the dogs. Does she really remain our mother? If a wife has become a whore, are we really still bound to her in fidelity? A motherland that betrays its soldiers, is that really a motherland? And everything turned topsy-turvy for Yuri. He used to take pride in his father. Now he cursed him. For the first time he began to consider that his father had, in essence, betrayed his oath to that army in which he had been brought up had betrayed it in order to help establish this system which now betrayed its own soldiers. Why, then, was Yuri bound by his own oath to that traitorous system? When, in the spring of 1943, recruiters from the first Bielorussian legions put in an appearance, some POWs signed up with them to escape starvation. Yuri went with them out of conviction, with a clear mind. But he didn't stay in the legion for long. As the saying goes, once they've skinned you, there's no point in grieving over the wool. By this time, Yuri had given up hiding his excellent knowledge of German, and soon a certain chief, a German from near Kassel, who had been assigned to create an espionage school with an accelerated wartime output, took Yuri as his right-hand man. And that was how Yuri began the downward slide he had not foreseen. That was how things got turned around. Yuri passionately desired to free his motherland, and what did they do but shove him into training spies? The Germans had their own plans. Just where could one draw the line? Which step was the fatal one? Yuri became a lieutenant in the German army. He traveled through Germany in German uniform, spent some time in Berlin, visited Russian emigres, and read authors like Bunin, Nabokov, Aldanov, and Fetertrov, whose works were forbidden at home. Yuri had anticipated that in all their writing, in Bunin's, for example, the blood flowing from Russia's living wounds would pour from every page. What was wrong with them? To what did they devote their unutterably precious freedom? To the female body? To ecstasy, sunsets, the beauty of noble brows? To anecdotes going back to dusty years? They wrote as if there had been no revolution in Russia, or as if it were too complex for them to explain. They left it to young Russian people to find for themselves what was highest in life. And Yuri dashed back and forth, in a hurry to see, in a hurry to know, and meanwhile, in accordance with ancient Russian tradition, he kept drowning his confusion more and more often and more and more deeply in vodka. What was their spy school really? It was, of course, not a real one. All they could be taught in six months was to master the parachute, the use of explosives, and the use of portable radios. The Germans put no special trust in them. In sending them across the lines, they were simply whistling in the dark. And for those dying, hopelessly abandoned Russian POWs, those schools, in Yuri's opinion, were a good way out. The men ate their fill, got new warm clothing, and in addition had their pockets stuffed with Soviet money. The students, and their teachers, acted as if all this nonsense were genuine, as if they would actually carry out spying missions in the Soviet rear, blow up the designated objectives, get back in touch with the Germans via radio, and return to the German lines. But in reality, in their eyes, this school was simply a means of sidestepping death and captivity. They wanted to live, but not at the price of shooting their own compatriots at the front. Of course, our Soviet interrogators did not accept this line of reasoning. What right did they have to want to live at a time when privileged families in the Soviet rear lived well without collaborating? No one ever thought of considering that these boys had refused to take up German arms against their own people. 
For playing spies, they were nailed with the very worst and most serious charges of all, Article 58.6, plus sabotage with intent. This meant to be held until dead. The Germans sent them across the front lines, and from then on their free choice depended on their own morality and conscience. They all threw away their TNT and radio apparatus immediately. The only point on which they differed was whether to surrender to the authorities immediately, like the snub-nosed spy I had encountered at Army Counterintelligence Headquarters, or whether to get drunk first and have some fun squandering all that free money. None of them ever recrossed the front lines to the German. Suddenly, as the new year of 1945 approached, one smart fellow did return and reported he had carried out his assignment. Just go and check on it. He created a sensation. The chief hadn't the slightest doubt that Smirsch had sent him back and decided to shoot him. The fate of a conscientious spy. But Yuri insisted that he be given a decoration instead and held up as an example to the others taking the course. The returned spy invited Yuri to drink a quart of vodka with him and crimson from drink leaned across the table and disclosed Yuri Nikolaevich the Soviet command promises you forgiveness if you will come over to us immediately. Yuri trembled, and that heart which had already grown hard, which had renounced everything, was flooded with warmth. The motherland? Accursed, unjust, but nonetheless still precious. Forgiveness? And he could go back to his own family? And walk along Kamnur, Strovsky, and Leningrad? All right, so what? We are Russians. If you will forgive us, we will return, and we will behave ourselves. Oh, how well! That year and a half since he had left the POW camp had not brought Yuri happiness. He did not repent, but he could see no future either. And when, while drinking, he encountered other such unrepentant Russians, he learned that they realized clearly that they had nothing to stand on. It wasn't real life. The Germans were twisting them to suit themselves. But now, when the Germans were obviously losing the war... Yuri had been offered an out. His chief, who liked him, confided that he had a second estate in Spain, which they could head for together if the German Reich went up in smoke. But there, across the table, sat his drunken compatriot, coaxing him at the risk of his own life. Yuri Nikolaevich, the Soviet command values your experience and knowledge. They want you to tell them about the organization of the German intelligence service. For two weeks, Yuri was torn by hesitation. But during the Soviet offensive beyond the Vistula, after he had led his school well out of the way, he ordered them to turn into a quiet Polish farm, lined them all up, and declared, I am going over to the Soviet side. There is a free choice for everyone. And these sad sack spies, with the milk hardly dry on their lips, who just one hour before had pretended loyalty to the German Reich, now cried out with enthusiasm, Hurrah! Us too! They were shouting hurrah for their future lives at hard labor. Then the entire spy school hid until the arrival of the Soviet tanks, and then came Smirsch. Yuri saw his boys no more. They took him off by himself and gave him ten days to describe the whole history of the school, the programs, the sabotage assignments. He really thought that they valued his experience and knowledge. They were already talking about his going home to his family. Only when he arrived at the Lubyanka did he realize that even in Salamanca he would have been closer to his native neighbor. He could now await being shot, or in any case a sentence of certainly not less than twenty years. So immutably does a human being surrender to the mist of the motherland. Just as a tooth will not stop aching until the nerve is killed, so is it with us. We shall probably not stop responding to the call of the motherland until we swallow arsenic. The Lotus Eaters in the Odyssey knew of a certain Lotus for that purpose. In all, Yuri spent three weeks in our cell. I argued with him during all those weeks. I said that our revolution was magnificent and just, that only its 1929 distortion was terrible. He looked at me regretfully, compressing his nervous lips. Before trying our hands at revolution, we should have exterminated the bedbugs in this country. Sometimes, oddly, he and Fastenko arrived at the same conclusions, approaching them from such different beginnings. 
I said there'd been a long period in which the people in charge of everything important in our country had been people of unimpeachably lofty intentions and totally dedicated. He said that from the very beginning they were all cut from the same cloth as Stalin. We agreed that Stalin was a gangster. I praised Gorky to the skies. What a smart man he had been, how correct his point of view, what a great artist he was. And Yuri parried. He was an insignificant, terribly boring personality. He invented himself, he invented his heroes, and his books were fabrications from beginning to end. Lev Tolstoy, he was the king of our literature. As a result of these daily arguments, vehement because of our youth, he and I were never able to become really close or to discern and accept in each other more than we rejected. They took him out of our cell, and since then, no matter how often I have inquired, I have found no one who was imprisoned with him in the Butirki, and no one who encountered him in a transit prison. Even the rank and file Vlasov men have all disappeared without a trace, under the earth most likely, and even now some of them do not have the documents they need in order to leave the northern wastes. But even among them, the fate of Yuri Y was not a rank and file fate. At long last, our Lubyanka lunch arrived. Long before it got to us, we could hear the cheery clatter in the corridor, and then, as in a restaurant, they brought in a tray with two aluminum plates, not bowls, for each prisoner. One plate held a ladle full of soup, and the other a ladle full of the thinnest kind of thin gruel, with no fat in it. In his first excitement, a prisoner couldn't get anything down his throat. There were those who didn't touch their bread for several days, who didn't know where to put it. But gradually one's appetite returned, and then a chronically famished state ensued that became almost uncontrollable. Then, if one managed to get it under control, one's stomach shrank and adapted itself to inadequate food, at which point the meagre Lubyanka fare became just right. One needed to have self-control to achieve this, and also needed to stop looking around to see who might be eating something extra. All those extremely dangerous prison conversations about food had to be outlawed, and one had to try to lift oneself, as far as possible, into higher spheres. At the Lubyanka, this was made easier by our being permitted two hours of rest after lunch, something else that was astonishingly resort-like. We lay down, our backs to the peephole, set up open books for appearance's sake, and dozed off. Sleep was forbidden, strictly speaking, and the guards could see that the pages of the books hadn't been turned for a long time. But ordinarily, they did not knock during this period. The explanation for this humanitarianism was that whoever wasn't resting during these hours was undergoing interrogation. Thus, for those who were stubborn, who had not signed the depositions, the contrast was unmistakable. They returned to the cell at the very end of the rest period. And sleep was the very best thing for hunger and anguish. One's organism cooled off, and the brain stopped recapitulating one's mistakes over and over again. Then they brought in dinner, another ladle of gruel. Life was setting all its gifts before you. After that, you were not going to get anything to eat in the five or six hours before bedtime, but that was not so terrible. It was easy to get used to not eating in the evenings. That has long been known in military medicine, and in reserve regiments they don't have anything to eat in the evening. Then came the time for the evening visit to the toilet, for which, in all likelihood, you had waited all a-tremble all day. How relieved, how eased the whole world suddenly became, how the great questions all simplified themselves at the same instant. Did you feel it? Oh, the weightless Lubyanka evenings, only weightless, incidentally, if you were not awaiting a night interrogation, a weightless body just sufficiently satisfied by soup so that the soul did not feel oppressed by it. What light, free thoughts. It was as if we had been lifted up to the heights of Sinai, and there the truth manifested itself to us from out the fire. Was it not of this that Pushkin dreamed, I want to live, to think, and suffer? And there we suffered, and we thought, and there was nothing else in our lives. How easy it turned out to be to attain that ideal. Some evenings I would get involved in arguments with drawing from a chess game with Susi or from a book. Again, I would have the sharpest quarrels with Yuri, because the questions were all explosive ones. For example, the question of the outcome of the war. 
The jailer, without any word or change of expression, would come in and pull down the dark blue blackout blind on the window. And then, out there on the other side of the blind, evening Moscow would begin to send up salutes. And just as we could not see the salutes lighting up the heavens, we were unable to see the map of Europe. Yet we tried to picture it in all its details and to guess which cities had been taken. Yuri was especially tormented by those salutes, appealing to fate to correct his own mistakes. He assured us that the war was by no means finished, and that the Red Army and the Anglo-American forces would now go for each other's throats, that the real war would really begin now. The others in the cell took a greedy interest in this prediction. How would such a conflict end? Yuri claimed it would end with the easy destruction of the Red Army. Would this result in our liberation or our execution? I objected to this, and we got into heated arguments. It was his contention that our army was worn down, bled white, poorly supplied, and most importantly that it would not fight with its usual determination against the Allies. I, however, insisted, on the basis of the units I had been familiar with, that the army was not so much worn down as experienced, that it had now become both strong and mean and that in such an event it would crush the Allies even more thoroughly than it had the Germans. Never, cried Yuri in a half-whisper. And what about the Ardennes? I answered in a half-whisper. Fastenko interrupted us, ridiculing us both, informing us that we did not understand the West, and that no one, now or ever, could compel the Allied armies to fight against us. However, in the evening we didn't want to argue so much as to hear something interesting that might bring us closer together and to talk in a spirit of fellowship. One favourite subject of conversation was prison traditions, how it used to be in prison. We had Fastenko and were therefore able to hear these stories at first hand. What dismayed us most of all was to learn that it had previously been an honour to be a political prisoner, and that it was not only their relatives who stuck by them and refused to renounce them, but that girls who had never even met them came to visit them, pretending for that purpose to be their fiancés. And what about the once universal tradition of gifts for the prisoners on holidays? No one in Russia ever broke the Lenten fast without first taking gifts for unknown prisoners to the common prison kitchen. They brought in Christmas hams, tarts, and kulichi, the special Russian Easter cakes. One poor old lady even used to bring a dozen coloured Easter eggs. It made her feel better. And where had all that Russian generosity gone? It had been replaced by political consciousness. That was how cruelly and implacably they had terrified our people and cured them of taking thought for and caring for those who were suffering. Today it would seem silly to do such a thing. If it was proposed today that some institution organize a pre-holiday collection of gifts for prisoners in the local prison, it would be virtually considered an anti-Soviet revolt. That's how far we have gone along the road to being brutalized. And what about those holiday gifts? Were they only a matter of tasty food? More importantly, those gifts gave the prisoners the warm feeling that people in freedom were thinking about them and were concerned for them. Fastenko told us that even in the Soviet period a political Red Cross had existed. We found this difficult to imagine. It wasn't that we thought he was telling us an untruth. Somehow we just couldn't picture such a thing. He told us that Y.P. Peshkova taking advantage of her personal immunity, had travelled abroad, collected money there, we did not collect much here, and then seen to it that foodstuffs were bought in Russia for political prisoners who had no relatives. For all political prisoners? And he explained at this point that the K.R.s, the so-called counter-revolutionaries, engineers and priests, for example, weren't included, but only members of former political parties. Well, why didn't you say so right away? Yes, and then for the most part the political Red Cross, except Peshkova, was itself liquidated and its staff imprisoned. It was also very pleasant, on those evenings when one wasn't expecting interrogation, to talk about getting out of prison. Yes, they said there had been astonishing instances when they did release someone. One day they took Z blank V from our cell with his things, perhaps to free him, but his interrogation could not have been completed so swiftly. Ten days later he returned. They had dragged him off to Lefortobo. When he got there he had evidently begun to sign things very quickly. So they brought him back to us. 
Now, if they should just release you, we would say to a fellow prisoner, since your case, after all, isn't very serious, as you yourself say, then you must promise to go see my wife, and, to show you've done it, tell her, let's say, to put two apples in my next parcel. But there aren't any apples anywhere right now, so tell her to put in three bagels. But then there mightn't be any bagels in Moscow either. So, all right, it will just have to be four potatoes. That's how the discussion went, and then they actually did take N off, with his fingers, and M got four potatoes in his next parcel. Truly astonishing. It was more than a coincidence. So they had really let him go. And his case was much more serious than mine. So maybe soon. However, what really happened was that M's wife bought five potatoes, but one of them got crushed in her bag, and M was in the hold of a ship, en route to the Colima. And so it went. We talked about all kinds of things and recalled something amusing, and it was all very jolly and delightful to be among interesting people who were so different from those you used to spend your life with and who came from outside your own circle of experience. Meanwhile, the silent evening check-up had come and gone, and they had taken eyeglasses away, and the light bulb had blinked three times. That meant that bedtime would be in five minutes. Quick, quick, grab a blanket. Just as you never knew at the front when a hail of shells would begin to fall all around you, here you didn't know which would be your fateful interrogation night, and we would lie down with one arm on top of the blanket and try to expel the whirlwind of thought from our heads. Go to sleep. And at a certain moment on an April evening, soon after we had seen Yuri off, the lot rattled. Hearts tightened. For whom had they come? Now the jailer would whisper, Name with S, name with Z. But the guard did not whisper anything. The door closed. We raised our heads. There was a newcomer at the door. On the thin side, young, in a cheap blue suit and a dark blue cap. He had nothing with him. He looked around in a state of confusion. What's the cell number? He asked in alarm. Fifty-three. He shuddered a bit. Are you from freedom? We asked. No. He shook his head in a painful sort of way. When were you arrested? Yesterday morning. We roared. He had a very gentle, innocent sort of face, and his eyebrows were nearly white. What for? It was an unfair question. One could not really expect an answer. Oh, I don't know. Nothing much. That was how they all replied. Everyone here was imprisoned because of nothing much. And to the newly arrested prisoner, his own case always seemed especially nothing much. But anyway, what was it? Well, you see, I wrote a proclamation to the Russian people. What? None of us had ever run into that sort of nothing much. Are they going to shoot me? His face grew longer. He kept pulling at the visor of the cap he had still not taken off. Well, no, probably not, we reassured him. They don't shoot anyone nowadays. They give out tenors every time the clock strikes. Are you a worker or a white-collar employee? asked the social democrat, true to his class principles. A worker. Fastenko reached out a hand to him and triumphantly proclaimed to me, You see, Alexander Isayevich, that's the mood of the working class. He turned away to go to sleep, assuming that there was nowhere else to go from there and nothing else to listen to. But he was wrong. What do you mean, a proclamation? Just like that, without any reason? In whose name was it issued? In my own. And who are you? The newcomer smiled with embarrassment. The Emperor, Mikhail. An electric shock ran through us all. Once again we raised ourselves on our cots and looked at him. No, his shy, thin face was not in the least like the face of Mikhail Romanov. And then his age, too. Tomorrow, tomorrow, time to sleep now, said Susie sternly. We went to sleep, confident that the two hours before the morning bread ration were not going to be boring. They brought in a cot and bedding for the emperor, and he lay down quietly next to the latrine bucket. In 1916, a portly stranger, an elderly man with a light brown beard, entered the home of the Moscow locomotive engineer Belov, 
and said to the engineer's pious wife, Pelageia, you have a year old son. Take good care of him for the Lord. The hour will come, and I will come to you again. Then he left. Pelageia did not have the faintest idea who this man was, but he had spoken so clearly and authoritatively that her mother's heart accepted his word as law. And she cared for her child like the apple of her eye. Victor grew up to be quiet, obedient, and pious, and he often saw visions of the angels and the Holy Virgin. But as he grew up, these visions became less frequent. The elderly man did not come again. Victor learned to be a chauffeur, and in 1936 he was taken into the army and sent off to Birobidjan, where he was stationed in an auto transport company. He was not at all overly familiar or cheeky, and perhaps it was his quiet demeanor and modesty, so untypical of a chauffeur, which attracted a civilian girl employee. But the commander of his platoon was after the same girl, and found himself out in the cold because of Victor. At this time, Marshal Blücher came to their area for maneuvers, and his personal chauffeur fell seriously ill. Blücher ordered the commander of the motor company to send him the best driver in the company. The company commander summoned the platoon commander, who immediately latched onto the idea of dumping his rival, Beloff. That's the way it often is in the army. The person who deserves promotion doesn't get it, and the person they want to get rid of does. In addition, Beloff was sober, a hard worker, and reliable. He wouldn't let them down. Blücher liked Beloff, so Beloff stayed with him. Soon Blücher was summoned to Moscow on a plausible pretext. This was how they separated the marshal from his power base in the Far East before arresting him. He had brought his own chauffeur, Belov, to Moscow with him. Having lost his boss, Belov then landed in the Kremlin garage and began chauffeuring, sometimes for Mikhailov of the Komsomol, sometimes for Lozovsky or somebody else in the leadership, and finally for Khrushchev. He had a close view of things, and he told us a lot, too, about the feasts, the morals the security precautions. As a representative of the rank-and-file Moscow proletariat, he was also present at the trial of Bukharin in the House of the Unions. Of all those for whom he worked, he spoke well only of Khrushchev. Only in Khrushchev's home was the chauffeur seated at the family table, instead of being put in the kitchen. Only there, in those years, did he find the simplicity of the working man's life preserved. Khrushchev, who enjoyed life hugely, also became attached to Viktor Alexeyevich, and in 1938, when he left for the Ukraine, he tried to get him to go along. I would have stayed with Khrushchev forever, said Viktor Alexeyevich, but for some reason he felt he should remain in Moscow. For a while, in 1941, before the beginning of the war, he was not employed in the government garage, and having no one to protect him, he was taken into military service. But because his health was poor, he was not sent to the front, but to a labor battalion. First they went on foot to Inza to dig trenches and build roads there. After his secure and prosperous life of the previous few years, he found it painful to have his nose shoved in the dirt. He drank a full draught of grief and poverty there, and on every side he saw not only that people had not begun to live better before the war, but that they were deeply impoverished. Just barely surviving himself, and released from the service because of illness, he returned to Moscow and again managed to get himself a job as chauffeur for Sherbakov. And after that, for Sedin, People's Commissar of Petroleum. He used to describe how the obese Sherbakov hated to see people around when he arrived at his inform bureau, so they temporarily removed all those who were working in the offices he had to walk through. Grunting because of his fat, he would lean down and pull back a corner of the carpet. And the whole inform bureau caught it, if he found any dust there. But Zedin embezzled funds to the tune of 35 million, and was quietly removed. And Belov was once again out of a job, driving for the leaders. He became a chauffeur at an automobile depot, and in his spare time he used to moonlight with his car on the road to Krasnaya Pakra. But his thoughts were already centered elsewhere. In 1943 he had been visiting his mother. She was doing the laundry, and had gone out to the hydrant with her pails. The door opened, and a portly stranger, an old man with a white beard, 
entered the house. He crossed himself at the icon there, looked sternly at Beloff and said to him, Hail, Mikhail, God gives you his blessing. Beloff replied, My name is Victor. But, the old man continued, you are destined to become Mikhail, the emperor of holy Russia. Just then, Victor's mother returned and half collapsed in fright, spilling her pails. It was the very same old man who had come to her twenty-seven years before. He had turned white in the meantime, but it was he. God bless you, Pelagea, you have preserved your son, said the old man. And he took the future emperor aside, like a patriarch preparing to enthrone him, and announced to the astonished young man that in 1953 there would be a change in rule and that he would become emperor of all Russia. The prophetic old man made only one mistake. He confused the chauffeur with his former employer. That is why the number of our cell, 53, shocked him so. To this end, the old man told him, he was to begin to gather his forces in 1948. The old man didn't instruct him as to how to gather his forces. He departed, and Viktor Alexeyevich didn't get around to asking. All the peace and simplicity of his life were lost to him now. Perhaps some other individual would have recoiled from the ambitious program, but Viktor, as it happened, had rubbed shoulders with the highest of the high. He had seen all those Mikhailovs, Sherbakovs, Sedins, and he had heard a lot from other chauffeurs, too, and he had gotten it clear in his own mind that nothing in the least unusual was required, in fact, just the reverse. The newly anointed Tsar, quiet, conscientious, sensitive, like Fyodor Ivanovich, the last of the line of Ryurik, felt on his brow the heavy pressure of the crown of Monomach. All around him were the people's poverty and grief, for which he had not until now borne any responsibility. Now all this lay upon his shoulders, and he was to blame for the fact that this misery still existed. It seemed strange to him to wait until 1948, and therefore, in that very autumn of 1943, he wrote his first proclamation to the Russian people and read it to four of his fellow workers in the garage of the People's Commissariat of Petroleum. We had surrounded Viktor Alexeyevich from early morning, and he had meekly told us all this. We had still not fathomed his childish trustfulness. We were absorbed in his unusual story, and it was our fault. We forgot to warn him about the stoolie. In fact, we never even thought for one minute that there was anything in the naive and simple story he had told us that the interrogator didn't already know. The instant the story ended... Kramarenko began demanding to be taken either to the chief of the prison for tobacco or else to the doctor. At any rate, they summoned him quickly. And as soon as he got there, he put the finger on those four workers in the garage of the People's Commissariat of Petroleum, whose existence no one would ever have suspected. The next day, returning from his interrogation, Beloff was astonished that the interrogator knew about them. And that's when it hit us. Those workers had heard the proclamation and approved it all, and no one had turned in the emperor. But he himself felt that it was too early, and he burned it. A year passed. Viktor Alexeyevich was working as a mechanic in the garage of an automobile depot. In the fall of 1944, he again wrote a proclamation and gave it to ten people to read, chauffeurs and lathe operators. All of them approved it, and no one turned him in. It was a surprising thing, indeed, that not one person in that group of ten had turned him in, in that period of ubiquitous stool pigeons. Fastenko had not been mistaken in his deductions about the mood of the working class. True, in this case the emperor had used some innocent tricks. He had thrown out hints that a strong arm inside the government was on his side, and he had promised his supporters travel assignments to rally monarchic sentiment at the grassroots. Months went by. The emperor entrusted his secret to two girls at the garage. But this time there was no misfire. These girls turned out to be ideologically sound, and Viktor Alexeyevich's heart sank. He had a premonition of disaster. On the Sunday after the Annunciation, he went to the market, carrying the proclamation with him. One of his sympathizers among the old workers saw him there and said, Victor, you ought to burn that piece of paper for the time being. How about it? And Victor felt clearly that he had written it too soon and that he should burn it. I'll burn it right now, you're right. 
and he started home to burn it. But right there in the market, two pleasant young men called out to him, Viktor Alexeyevich, come along with us. And they took him to the Lubyanka in a private car. When they got him there, they had been in such a hurry and were so excited that they didn't search him in the usual way, and there was a moment when the emperor almost destroyed his proclamation in the toilet. But he decided that it would be the worst for him, that they would keep after him anyway to find out where it was, and they straight away took him in an elevator up to a general and a colonel, and the general with his own hands grabbed the proclamation from Victor's pocket. However, it took only one interrogation for the big Lubyanka to quiet down again. It turned out to be not so dangerous. Ten arrests in the garage of the auto depot and four in the garage of the People's Commissariat of Petroleum. The interrogation was turned over to a lieutenant colonel who had a good laugh as he went through the proclamation. You write here, Your Majesty. In the first spring I will instruct my Minister of Agriculture to dissolve the collective farms. But how are you going to divide up the tools and livestock? You haven't got it worked out yet. And then you also write, I am going to increase housing construction and house each person next to the place he works, and I am going to raise all the workers' wages. And where are you going to find the money, Your Majesty? Are you going to have to run the money off on printing presses? You are going to abolish the state loans. And then, too, I am going to wipe the Kremlin from the face of the earth. But where are you going to put your own government? What about the building of the big Lubyanka? Would you like to take a tour of inspection and look it over? Many of the younger interrogators also stopped by to make fun of the emperor of all Russia. They saw nothing except comedy in all this. And it was not always easy for us in the cell to keep a straight face. We hope you aren't going to forget us here in cell number 53, said Z blank V, winking at the rest of us. Everyone laughed at him. Viktor Alexeyevich, with his white eyebrows and innocent simplicity and his calloused hands, would treat us when he received boiled potatoes from his unfortunate mother, Pelageya, without ever dividing them into yours and mine. Come on, comrades, eat up, eat up. He used to smile shyly. He understood perfectly well how uncontemporary and funny all this was, to be the emperor of all Russia. But what could he do if God's choice had fallen on him? They soon removed him from our cell. When they introduced me to Khrushchev in 1962, I wanted to say to him, Nikita Sergeyevich, you and I have an acquaintance in common. But I told him something else, more urgent, on behalf of former prisoners. Just before May the 1st, they took down the blackout shade on the window. The war was perceptibly coming to an end. That evening it was quieter than ever before in the Lubyanka. It was, I remember, almost like the second day of Easter, since May Day and Easter came one after the other that year. All the interrogators were out in Moscow celebrating. No one was taken to interrogation. In the silence we could hear someone across the corridor protesting. They took him from the cell and into a box. By listening we could detect the location of all the doors. They left the door of the box open and they kept beating him a long time. In the suspended silence every blow on his soft and choking mouth could be heard clearly. On May the 2nd, a 30-gun salute roared out. That meant a European capital. Only two had not yet been captured, Prague and Berlin. We tried to guess which it was. On the 9th of May, they brought us our dinner at the same time as our lunch, which was done at the Lubyanka only on May the 1st and November the 7th. And that is how we guessed that the war had ended. That evening, they shot off another 30-gun salute. We then knew that there were no more capitals to be captured, and later that same evening one more salute roared out, forty guns, I seem to remember, and that was the end of all the ends. Above the muzzle of our window, and from all the other cells of the Lubyanka, and from all the windows of all the Moscow prisons, we, too, former prisoners of war and former front-line soldiers, watched the Moscow heavens patterned with fireworks and crisscrossed by the beams of searchlights. Boris Gamarov, a young anti-tank man, already demobilized because of wounds, with an incurable wound in his lung, having been arrested with a group of students, was in prison that evening in an overcrowded Butyrki cell, 
where half the inmates were former POWs and frontline soldiers. He described this last salute of the war in a terse eight-stanza poem in the most ordinary language, how they were already lying down on their board bunks, covered with their overcoats, how they were awakened by the noise, how they raised their heads, squinted up at the muzzle, oh, it's just a salute, and then lay down again, and once again covered themselves with their coats, with those same overcoats which had been in the clay of the trenches and the ashes of bonfires and been torn to tatters by German shell fragments. That victory was not for us, and that spring was not for us either. 